Good afternoon. Um, I think in the interests of time, we'll uh, get on with the next session. Um, but I'd just like to share with you maybe a little anecdote. All this work in uh, risk stratification and molecular classifications actually started with the US FDA. And they called a meeting, I think, about 10 years ago uh, of uh, thought leaders in the field because they were concerned there had been very little progress in the development of new therapies for bladder cancer. So um, the work started actually with muscle invasive cancers, as you know. And now it's moved to non-muscle invasive cancers. And I think in terms of the kind of research going on in bladder cancer now, uh, this particular area of research has the greatest potential for completely changing how we manage uh, urothelial carcinoma. So it's, uh, I'm really pleased that the uh, scientific uh, committee put this into the program. And we have a very good speaker to explain this to her. Uh, to us. Uh, Maria Ribald is a urologist, uh, but also someone who's had a 20-year interest in molecular markers and uh, molecular diagnosis. And she also sits on the guidelines committees for the EAU for muscle invasive disease. So this is a somewhat complex uh, topic, but I hope she will cast some understanding and insight for you. So without further ado, shall we go on with the video presentation? Uh, Maria will not be present to take Q&A, so um, listen, and I hope that uh, it comes across to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to be with you and that you have already invited me to, to participate in this Eurofair of the Singapore Urological Association. It's my pleasure to be here. I would rather prefer to be with you there, but uh, sadly I have not this option, but at least we have learned that I can be with you online. So uh, today the main issue for my talk is try to explain or to talk about why we need a risk stratification for non muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. These are my disclosures. And going directly to the issue that we want to discuss today, the truth is that uh, we need to understand first that non muscle invasive bladder cancer is really an heterogeneous disease. Yeah? Uh, it goes from those that will never endanger life to that ones that uh, they have such a risk of progression that we have not the chance to lose or to waste uh, time. There are those that will never progress and those that are at very high risk of progression. And why is important to know that upfront? Because if we want to change the natural history of even muscle invasive bladder cancer, we should be able to act upfront and to be aggressive on those that are going to progress. So acting at early stage could be of help to improve the overall survival of the whole disease. So said that, it's important that we have some tools for strat stratifying the disease. And uh, what do we expect from a prognostic model? First is that this model uh, should be able to discriminate, to understand which are going the patients that are going to progress. And those patients at the same group should have a similar risk of that event, and then also calibration. We need to accurately predict the course of the disease in an individual patient, not only as a group, but also in the individuals. And for doing that, we need prognostic tools. And just for building these prognostic tools, what we can use is those data that we already have. And at that moment, at that moment currently, the data that we have are data mainly derived from uh, uh, clinical evolution or pathological tumor characteristics. It's true that probably if we integrate the type of therapy that these patients receive into these prognostic models, perhaps we can modify the way that we stratify them. Said that, and uh, knowing that we need to classify them because it's really important, let's see which has been the evolution of the classification of non-muscle invasive 
uh, bladder cancer during the years. And we have four uh, main stratification tools that started at 2006, 9, 16, and currently 2021. In uh, in uh, 26, in 2006, the first progression model came from the study of patients at the EORTC trials. This uh, was based on data from more than 2,500 patients, and uh, they study and they do models even for recurrence and also for progression. And uh, these patients were primary tumors, not treated with BCG at that moment, and it allowed us to create a classification into low risk, intermediate, and high risk of progression. This classification was uh, incorporated into our EAU guidance. And you can see that those patients at high risk of progression, even half of them will progress, those classified as high risk at five years. This is a very high ratio of progression. The truth is that when this classification was already incorporated into our guidance, it's true that years after, it appears another classification coming from a Spanish group, is the, is the group Cueto. And uh, this classification incorporates data on almost thousand something patients, but this time treated with PCG because the treatment of PCG could alter or could modify the risk of progression. And the truth is, that these patients were treated with um, BCG induction, and even treated with BCG induction, we can see that the risk of progression for those at the highest risk were even higher at 33%. In 2016, another classification came in, and came in from uh, a reanalysis of those patients at EORTC trials, this time uh, almost 2,000 patients, but this time treated with BCG. And not only with induction BCG, as uh, the Cueto group already did, but also treated with maintenance. In this group, however, uh, it was not incorporated patients with primary CIS. And the truth is that uh, this classification was more or less modified, and for the first time, we included not only the three groups, low risk, intermediate, and high, but a sub-classification into the high of those at highest risk of progression. Finally, we arrived to 2021, and the EAU non-muscle invasive bladder cancer panel released their new risk stratification for non-muscle invasive disease. This was already published into our guidelines and also in our main journal in European Urology. This classification is based on 100% primary tumors, is only a calculator of progression, not of recurrence. It uses both grading classification, that one at 2004 and the new one in uh, 2016. There are no patients treated with PCG. Why? Because this is thought to be a classification upfront, not of patients already treated. It allows us to classificate patients, classificate patients into four risks. And for those risk factors that has not been really analyzed in these patients directly, a, a systematic review of the literature was done, looking for uh, data coming from variant histology, primary C's, or um, recurrent tumors. This is the classification, the new classification, into four risk groups, the low, the intermediate, the high risk, and the very high risk. And we can see how the patients could be classified. And also it takes into account other clinical risk factors at the age of over 70, multiple papillary tumors, and the size of the tumor. This has been incorporated into our EAU guidelines in 2021. As I told you, this classification is based on the individual patient data analysis of more than 3,000, nearly 3,500 patients treated with QRVT and immediate installation of chemotherapy. We use for this classification both the grading classification coming from 2004, uh, 97 in 2004, and the new one 
2016. <coughs> Sorry. The limitations, obviously, is the, that this is an analysis uh, of data done retrospectively and that we have already joined uh, the analysis of data coming from a systematic review on CIS in the prostatic urethra, lymphovascular invasion, and uh, variant histologies. The protocol excludes precisely and specifically uh, those patients uh, with recurrent disease because this would like to be a classification for prognosis, not for recurrence. And uh, it has been seen that those tools or those prognostic factors for recur for uh, progression were different from those for recurrent. So recurrent disease should be classified, taking into account the features that allow them to be classified as all the others, the, the primary ones in low, intermediate, or high. Also, patients that were excluded were patients with primary CIS. And why? Because primary CIS is a very heterogeneous group uh, with uh, the prognosis uh, depend on several factors, if it's uh, focal or, or is it multifocal, and the group decide that even primary CIS, so CIS sorry, should be always classified as a high-risk disease. Uh, there were a patients not studied precisely on uh, this risk classification. Uh, these risk factors were incorporated into the classification mainly based on a systematic review of the literature. And was this is in the, the CIS in the urethra, the lymphovascular invasion, and different variant histologies uh, as micropapillary, micropapillary disease, plasmocytoid, sarcomatoid, or neuroendocrine types. This is the appearance of the uh, final uh, classification. Here uh, we can see that we have low risk disease, intermediate, then high, and then very high on VCG naive patients. And look at this data. The progression ratio for those patients classified as very high risk are pretty high. We have 44% of progression, risk of progression at five years, and 60% at 10 years. So those patients classify as very high risk disease, honestly deserves a special attention. You can find uh, this uh, uh, classification system into the web. If you go to this uh, web page, you can easily enter all the data coming from your patient, and finally you will obtain the risk of progression at one year, five years, and 10 years. So it's quite useful and you can use it in your daily basis. But even easier, because all of us bring the, our mobile phone with us, even if it's an iPhone or it's an Android, who matters? The question is that you have this calculator with you in your phone as an application. And again, it's quite easy to be used because the only thing that you need to do is just to put the data of your patients into the app, and then you will obtain, as you have already done on the web page, the data precisely for your own patients. So this would allow you to classify your patients. Well, said that, this classification has received some criticisms. Uh, for example, it's true that the intermediate risk group deserves probably a further uh, working. Why? Because <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Perhaps we can classify better these patients on the, in, in this intermediate group, group just to identify those that are closer to the low risk and those ones that are closer to the very high risk. So probably we need to do a more precise analysis of these uh, patients. And it has been said in a recently paper published even in our main journal, that this new classification coming from 2021 is not good for classifying patients uh, treated with PCG and that overestimate the risk of progression in this group. And the truth is that this is absolutely congruent with the idea of the classification because it's not thought for classifying patients treated with PCG. 
but we do it an earlier stage just to know those that probably deserve an aggressive therapy, more aggressive than BCG alone. Because we need to know something. Is that, uh, look, BCG is not perfect. And uh, the truth is that uh, uh, its impact on progression, uh, it has been said that it reduces progression on almost only 27%. And even we don't know which are these patients, and it has not been done a uh, subgroup analysis of those patients that are, for example, T1 high grade disease. So we only re reduce progression on 27%. And even we don't know which are the patients that are going to respond because we know that only 50% of them will respond to the BCG therapy. So uh, it's not the perfect therapy for avoiding progression in our patients at high risk of doing so. And if the patient progress and fail to the BCG therapy, then prognosis is worse than to a those patients that are at high risk up front. And then the only therapy nowadays approved for these patients is cystectomy because all the other alternatives has not been able to prove by the moment the survival at five years that radical cystectomy has done. But probably the most tricky thing is that uh, if we allow patients with non-muscle invasive disease to progress to muscle invasive disease, then we are changing the overall survival of 90% that we would be able to obtain doing an early cystectomy to 35% because those patients with muscle invasive disease that comes from non-muscle invasive disease has worse prognosis than those that are diagnosed with muscle invasive disease up front. So uh, we cannot lose this window of opportunity because if we sit in our table waiting for them to progress, we are compromising severely their uh, prognosis. So we need to understand which patients deserve an aggressive and early therapy. And the new classification of non-muscle invasive disease of uh, EAU released at 21 allow us to do that. So we can classify, classify patients at high risk as high risk tumors, and then probably they are good for receiving BCG therapy. But those at very high risk with 60% of progression, they should be explained the consideration of radical cystectomy upfront. Because if we do the radical cystectomy, when they are TP1 disease, survival at 10 years is 90%. If we do so, when they are muscle invasive, progression in survival at five years drops still 35%. So probably this new classification allows us better to understand the natural history of non-muscle invasive disease. Which would be the ideal? The ideal would be that we have markers that are, sorry, that we have markers that allow us probably to identify for sure who are those that are going to progress. In our own uh, molecular laboratory at the Hospital Clinic de Barcelona, we are been working on doing so, and we have, for example, generate a gene classifier trying to identify those patients that are T1 high-grade disease that are going to progress. This would be the ideal to have a gen signature that could be tested on the primary tumor and that allow us to say for sure this patient is going to progress. There's other groups, for example, obviously the iScope group, that they are already released a two-gene progression score for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, trying to identify those patients that uh, are at very high risk of, of progression as already our classification does with taking into account only clinical data. and more recently, other papers have been worked trying to identify which are those mutations that confers an aggressive uh, future 
to the high risk, non muscle invasive disease, and then probably they deserve radical cystectomy. But the truth is that all these classifiers are not yet prepared for, for being used in our clinical practice. So by the moment, the new classification release at 21 that allows us to classify patients as low, intermediate, high risk, and very high risk, could be really, really useful to consult our patients' option and to decide which deserves BCG and which deserves a more aggressive therapy. We should be brave and to give the chance to our patients to be treated early. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, we'll move on to the next talk because there's no Q&A &Q &A after this. Uh, it gives me a pleasure to introduce uh, our friend and colleague from NCC, Dr. Johan Chan, who uh, actually trained in Australia and he's with us uh, specializing in geo-oncology and geriatric oncology. So we've all heard about the level one evidence of uh, new adjuvant chemo and adjuvant chemotherapy for muscle invasive bladder disease. And he's here to tell us about the role of uh, immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me to the Eurofair. Um, these are my disclosures. Come up with the outline of the talk. I'll first be discussing of a case, a very simple case that we all will face in our clinics. And subsequently, I'll discuss the evidence of the trials above. And then we will end with the, my closing thoughts on what the role of the role of adjuvant immunotherapy. So the case study, we have a 65-year-old man who presents with hematuria to his urologist. Past medical history include hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He works in the petroleum industry and has been a smoker for 40 pack years. This is a scan. He had a three centimeter soft tissue mass in the bladder. There were no other visceral metastasis. He then seen his urologist, the urologist is a TURBT, for which the histology confirms at least T2 disease. He had good creatinine and was referred for us for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, he completed the neoadjuvant chemotherapy fine. It was a good partial response based on repeat scans. He underwent a radical cystectomy, which again showed residual disease. So, coming to the question of the topic of today, is there any role for treatment intensification? What are the trials available? At the moment, there are three randomized controlled trials that investigates this topic. Only two has been published. The other is still waiting. So we'll talk about Checkmate 274 first. Checkmate 274 is a phase three randomized double-blended study of adjuvant nivolumab versus placebo in these high-risk patients. In this trial, there were two main cohorts, patients who had new adjuvant chemotherapy, followed by radical cystectomy, then were randomized. All patients who had upfront radical cystectomy refused a new adjuvant, uh, refused adjuvant chemotherapy and were recruited. In this group of patients, they needed to have either T3 and above or N1 disease. Now, the randomization was one is to one to one year of nivolumab versus placebo. The primary endpoints were disease free survival in the intention to treat population arm, as well as disease free survival in the randomized population of PADL1 or more than 1%. Secondary endpoints include overall survival. Now, this is the baseline characteristics. As you can see here, majority of the patients have bladder primaries. Again, both arms are equal in terms of their new adjuvant chemotherapies. Um, similar to that as well, both arms had a reasonably high proportion of N1 disease, nodal disease. Now, this is the disease-free survival. The disease-free survival at six months for the patients in nivolumab was 75% compared to 60% with a hazard ratio of 0 0.7. And this was clinical significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. In the overall population with a pd one of more than 1%, at six months, patients who were alive and disease-free was 74.5% compared to 55.7% with a hazard ratio of 0 0.55. Again, this was clinical significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. In terms of the subgroup analysis, sorry, let me just go back. Majority of the patients had special benefit 
except for patients in the upper tract tumors, although these are again small numbers and the study was not powered to look at the difference between whether they were in the bl bl bladder or on the upper tracts, as well as uh, there should benefit in both patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapies, as well as but showed more benefit in patients with neoadjuvant chemotherapies compared to people who had uh, just cystectomy up front. In terms of the side effects, it's kind of expected. It's all what we know of. Grade 3 side effects, 17.9%. Grade 3 in, in requires admissions or requires steroids from the volumet. So just some thoughts about this study. Um, it's with, with relatively short follow-up. Adjuvant the volumet did demonstrate a clinical benefit in DFS benefits in both the intentional to treat population as well as in patients who have TPD one of more than 1%. A DFS benefit was observed in most of the clinical subgroups except the upper tract. Again, the study was not powered for this to look at different um, individual subgroups. Overall, survival is not reported, and the adverse effects are to be expected from nivolumab. I'll move on a little bit to talk about the next trial, which is the ATIZO study, uh, Invigo 10, Invigo 010. Again, this study had a similar trial schema to the previous. Again, it had two populations, patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and patients who had radical cystectomy up front and did not have any adjuvant chemotherapy. Again, it was a one-to-one -one randomization to atezo as well as placebo, and the primary endpoints were disease-free survival and overall survival. This is the baseline characteristics, actually very similar to the, of the nivolumab study. Majority of the patients were bladder tumors. Majority, 50, around 40% of the patients had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, again, very similar to the previous study. Again, Almost 50% of them had nodal disease on surgery. This is the disease-free survival in the intentionally to treat population. Unfortunately, this was a negative study. The median DFS was 19.4 months versus 16.4 months. The hazard ratio was 0 0.89. This is the interim overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.85. In terms of safety signals, very similar again to the nivolumab study, grade 3 side effects, around 16%. The conclusions from this study, Invigor 010 did not meet its primary endpoint of disease-free survival. That's the, that's the main endpoint that we need to go through. So I thought about, we go through about my closing thoughts on adjuvant immunotherapy. To date, there are now two randomized control trials that reveal adjuvant immunotherapy in bladder cancer with conflicting results. Nivolumab was positive for disease-free survival. Atezo was negative. There was a 16% chance in uh, grade 3 side effects. We really need to wait for the data for other trials, for example, the pembrolizumab, to see whether there would be more consistent evidence, as well as to look at long-term evidence for overall survival benefits with the nivolumab trial. This is what often my urologist colleague asks me. Hey, you know, I've got this patient that had Radical cystectomy, can you see him for adjuvant immunotherapy? When would I, con when, how would I counsel my patient? Well, I often start off with what I've went through. Importantly, disease free survival only. We do not have the overall survival. What does disease free survival mean? Are we treating early metastatic, metastatic disease yeah, up front? And that's why there's an improvement in disease free survival. Who knows? Importantly, this treatment is without side effects. There's a 16% chance there's a grade 3 side effects meaning that there may be some life-changing events, if, typically with immunotherapy relating to IRAs. There may be permanent sequelae from that. When do I really consider patients? I consider them when they had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as shown in the subgroup where there was more benefit. And even after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there's a high volume of this vestibular disease. And in these situations, it may be worthwhile trying. Uh, I'd like to end my speech, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. Um, that was uh, short and sweet. Uh, any questions for Dr. Chan? Um, in that case, I have a question for you. Um, we know that checkpoint inhibitors work very well with radiotherapy because of the DNA damage that ensues. Uh, do you think uh, adjuvant immunotherapy post-radiation actually works better than post-cystectomy? Uh, good question. We know this is based on several other studies in terms of 
chemotherapy and its its uh, synergism. I don't think we have any trials at the moment that we really look at that. And and therefore, the real question is, will we be implementing it upfront in our studies and in our clinical practice? I don't, the answer is, I really don't think we would, uh, but it would definitely be worthwhile to think about it as a research question. I mean, for instance, uh, there is, uh, we, we can practice a bladder sparing uh, treatment with uh, radiotherapy and concurrent chemo. Uh, are there any studies you know of that throw in uh, adjuvant immuno? No, not at the moment. Any, any other questions? Yes, over there. Thank you. That's a very succinct presentation of it. Um, comment. Um, how certain are you that the data is conflicting and it's not just telling us that NIVO works and Ezito doesn't? Uh, do you want to answer that before I go on to the next one? So, so, so the question is how, uh, how convinced am I with the NIVO? Yeah, the I used data to work conflicting NIVO. data. But you showed us that one drug seemed to work and the other clearly did not in this context. Right? So are you saying that there's still doubt that NIVO may not work at this level of evidence? Mm, well, I think that the key question that we really have to ask ourselves is disease-free survival equivalent to overall survival? Because the real question is, yes, no doubt there is a significant endpoint, primary endpoint, it met a significant and primary endpoint, which was disease-free survival. But the real question is, are we curing the disease or are we treating the disease early in the metastatic phase, leading towards an improvement in disease-free survival? The answer to that is we don't know. And I think that's why I think in this similar situations, having a longer follow-up to show that the to see if there's an improvement in overall survival, that will really be the key to see if we can cure bladder cancer in such a similar situation where the chance of recurrence is high. Yes, completely agree with that. Uh, so this is a space that we should continue to watch. Now the second point is this, it's observational, and it maybe represents a paradigm shift for medical oncologists. You are accustomed to measuring response in terms of resist criteria, etc. Measurable disease, observable disease. Uh, what we've learned with immunotherapy in the bladder, primarily with BCG, but also agents, is that tumor burden adversely affects the effectiveness of the therapy. So if immunotherapy is intended to work well and cure, as you mentioned, we should be looking for small burden of disease, maybe even microscopic level of disease, and just trust that if the immunotherapy is going to work, it's going to take care of that group of people. And we probably then need to watch them out five years, 10 years, 15 years, who knows, uh, to see effect. Whereas if we think of immunotherapy in the chemotherapeutic paradigm and treat actually the poor prognosis uh, tumors or patients with large burden of disease, then the likelihood is we'll see immunotherapy fail. What, what's your thoughts on what I just said? Totally agree. Totally agree. And that's the whole rationale for this study because don't forget what has happened is the patient had a radical cystectomy. And then after that, from the radical cystectomy, we base it on well, look, did they have a good complete response or was it just a partial response? And that's the role of why nivolumab was used. In fact, if you look at the other data that are coming out by, by Tom Powell, who recently only just released it in a further extrapolatory analysis on the Invigor 10010. In fact, he was looking at whether there's any role of MRD, looking at MRD, which is look at ctDNA, circulatory ctDNA, and if whether circulatory DNA was positive, whether would it affect a TESO, whether a TESO would, would have an effect in patients who had positive circular DNA after having had radical cystectomy versus patients who did not have circular DNA straight up front. And the results, in fact, was suggestive that atezolizumab did had a positive effect in patients who had positive circular DNA, uh, tumor DNA post-radical cystectomy. So I think your question to, for your question is it, highly relevant. In fact, MRD is, is something that we are investigating as well. There's this whole field that's changing with regards to 
how we detect MRD, mineral residual disease, um, post radical cystectomy, and how our treatments should be maybe targeting in this setting. Okay, sorry. With that, um, I'm afraid time is up. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chan again, and uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Gerald from Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital. It's my great pleasure today to introduce our next speaker, who will, because he's based in Hong Kong, will be uh, giving his presentation virtually. Uh, so our next speaker will be uh, Professor Jeremy Teo. Jeremy is the Assistant Dean and Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Medicine of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And his uh, main uh, research interests are in prostate and bladder cancer. Uh, he has been leading multi-center randomized controlled trials on the role of transurethral on block resection for bladder cancers. And uh, he's currently also studying the uro, urinary bio, biomarkers and, uh, and tumor heterogeneity uh, of bladder cancer. He's going to talk to us today about an increasingly uh, controversial but also a very topical topic, which is, uh, is it still in this day and age of uh, checkpoint inhibitors and uh, wonderful results from uh, immunotherapy, is it still considered a crime to preserve the bladder in muscle-invasive bladder cancer? Can we have the presentation? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It would be my pleasure to talk about this rather thought-provoking topic on preservation of bladder for muscle-invasive bladder cancer, and is it a crime? So these are my conflicts. I think the most important conflict is that I'm a urologist and I love doing robotic cystectomy, but I think I'm still you know, able to uh, give a fair and objective um, presentation on TMT and uh, what I feel TMT is like in the future. So first of all, is it really a crime? Crime seems to imply there's some kind of harm to our patients. And I think one thing that we need to recognizes that the goal of TMT is not only to preserve the bladder and quality of life, it also aims not to compromise any oncologic outcome. And if we don't affect the oncologic outcome, there's no crime. It's certainly something that is beneficial to our patients. And traditionally, the TMT is composed of three components. First would be the uh, radical or maximal TRVT kind of a sudden reductive approach aiming to remove all the physical tumors in the bladder. Second is the chemotherapy. Uh, it acts as a radio sensitizer to potentiate the effect of RT. And also in case there's micrometastasis, then chemotherapy may also be helpful. Last but not least, radiotherapy will further achieve a local tumor control both in the bladder and adjacent lymph nodes. When we think about the patients that we may consider TMT, there are two main groups of patients. First would be young, fit patients, muscle invasive, as in Rogers, you would think, you would think, come on, you must do radical cystectomy. But we also need to understand that some patients just wouldn't want to have such a major surgery, wouldn't accept a conduit, or doesn't even want a new bladder. But in these patients, we need to be particularly careful because long-term survival is very important. We're not talking about five years survival in these patients. We're talking about 10 years, 20 years, or even 30 years of survival. We aim for a cure. And so if we are planning for TMT in, these, in this group of patients, we must adopt strict criteria in order to avoid compromising the cancer control. The second group of patients will be those older, more fragile patients, even for cystectomy, you think they may not be fit for cystectomy. In those patients, probably quality of life is more important. And therefore, when we think about in the setting, quality of life is our preference, then a less stringent criteria can be applied. But of course, this has to be counseled, this has to be counseled adequately. They have need to understand the, the potential compromise in the survival outcome. But of course, I think the most important thing in TMT is what cases are considered suitable in terms of the disease status? In what situations would TMT achieve an excellent oncological outcome? And if we look into the literature, patients with solitary tumor, preferably T2 disease, not even T34, 
without any CIS, and if you are able to have gross total recession, then these patients tend to perform very well after TMT. On the other hand, patients with multiple bladder tumors, extensive CIS, T4 disease, or if there's any presence of hydronephrosis, these, these patients, um, uh, based on what we have in literature, these parameters basically are predictors of worse survival. In those situations, probably safer to have a more radical approach, and that is radical cystectomy. I think the planning for TMT should start as early as possible, even preferably, even before the first TRPT, because if you see an 80-year-old man, six centimeter bladder tumor, at that point, you probably think, you know, you need to think whether cystectomy is really feasible in those patients. If not, then we start to think about TMT. And CD scan, MRI scan, they will be helpful locally to look at a tumor locally. If it is done preoperatively, then it can help us decide whether the tumor is muscle invasive, whether there's any peripheral cycle extension. It's important for surgical planning. And in my center, even for big tumors, if we do TRPT, we tend to have a maximal uh, resection. We tend to take reference from the normal nutritional muscle layer around the tumor and have a maximal um, resection of the tumor. But sometimes, your patients might have TRP time elsewhere and then refer to you for muscle invasive disease. And you are uncertain how much tumor has been resected in the first TRPT. In those situations, of course, operative imaging is also important because you would know whether there's any significant amount of residual disease and whether a second TRPT is still worthwhile to perform. Regarding the use of um, second TRPT in the case of TMT, there's a small study about 90 patients with muscle invasive disease, about half of them underwent second TRPT. And um, among those who underwent second TRPT, 67% actually were found to have restored tumor. And as, um, as illustrated by the green curve here, patients who underwent second TRPT actually had a much better five-year disease-free survival as well as uh, overall survival. Although this is retrospective, certainly a lot of bias, but there's a good piece of evidence showing that the maximum recession is also important in the case of TMT. The second part is about chemotherapy. I think cisplatin-based chemotherapy is still considered the kind of a standard in, pay, in bladder cancer patients undergoing TMT, um, not only because of the cytotoxic effect, but also it has a radiosensitizing property, which can potentially uh, optimize the RT effects as well. Another option would be MMC together with uh, 5FU, which has been shown to have a radiosensitizing effect and acceptable toxicity in patients who are unfit for platinum-based chemotherapy. And we look into the experience from NGH. Um, they publish a pooled analysis on all the TMT trials they've done. And uh, there are some differences between the trials. Some has um, the use of new adjuvant chemo, some were followed by adjuvant chemo. But I think what's in common is the uh, RT concomitant uh, with um, cisplatin. So cisplatin and RT were given concomitantly um, uh, as part of TMT. And this has been shown to be the most important thing um, in optimizing the outcome. And we look into the outcomes. The first two, the top row there, it is the survival outcome stratified by the T staging. And why, why I say T2 disease is considered a better case selection is because T2 disease perform much better uh, than T3, 4 disease in the TMT setting. We look into the bottom row there. This is also something interesting because patients who were found to have complete response at the beginning, they tend to have a much better disease-specific survival as well as overall survival in the long run. And this also points to the fact that there may be a window for us to try this treatment. And in case we detect that there's incomplete response or we're not satisfied with the treatment response, we should consider early radical cystectomy in those cases and hopefully uh, still um, maintain the survival outcomes that we want it to be. And uh, an article, very famous one by uh, Nick James, RCT, comparing between RT alone versus RT together with chemotherapy, uh, 360 patients. Uh, in, in this cohort, the median age is about 72 years old. Uh, one thing to take note is that over 80% of the patients had T2 disease. And then 66% of the patients were considered having complete resection 
uh, before this uh, chemo RT. So these are you know relatively good patients when we contemplate for trimodal therapy. And what he found is that the group undergoing chemo RT again has a much better survival outcome when compared to RT alone. The two-year disease free survival was 67% compared to 54%. And even for the five-year overall survival, the chemo RT group is 48% versus 35%. So it kind of proves that the addition of chemotherapy is actually very useful in addition to RTLO in, in patients undergoing bladder sparing approach. In terms of the toxicity, um, the overall grade three to five um, adverse event is more or less similar, but if we look into gastrointestinal uh, toxicity, it's actually 9.6% uh, in the chemo RT group versus 2.7% in the RT group. So that is something that we need to tell patients about. For radiotherapy, the aim is to have is to enhance the local tumor control in the bladder as well as the adjacent pelvic lymph nodes. And there are two parts. First is the bladder part, whether you want to have whole pelvis RT or whether you just want to radiate the bladder alone. And the other part is about the lymph nodes part, um, how much you want to radi radiate. And typically, we radiate uh, up to the mid sacral iliac region with the upper limit of the common iliac artery bifurcation. We aim to deliver the RT, but as well try to conserve the small bowels in case uh, further urine diversions need in the future. And uh, regarding whole pelvis versus bladder alone chemo RT, um, this is an RCT involving 230 patients. Uh, what do they mean by bladder only RT is that they have a two centimeter, two centimeter margin uh, surrounding bladder. And what they found is that a bladder alone type of RT is able to have a similar um, survival outcomes as well as a similar bladder preservation rates when compared to whole pelvis RT. And the toxicity wise, um, the only difference is with well, the only uh, toxicity that almost reaches statistical significance is a diarrhea part, which I think is not very significant. 3.9% in the whole pelvis group versus 2% in the bladder only group. So I think the key message is that bladder only RT has a good cancer control. Toxicity might be slightly better, but this is probably not the biggest benefit uh, to our patients. The other is uh, again the, the randomized trial by Nick James, but then in the subgroup they actually had a two by two type of um, um, randomization. So patients were also randomized to having whole bladder versus reduced high dose volume RT. And what is meant by reduced high volume RT is that 100% of the reference dose to a bladder tumor is given together with 1.5% um, margin. This is towards the bladder tumor. But then 80% of the reference dose is to, towards the whole bladder wall together with 1.5 centimeter margin. And one thing to stress is that this is a non inferiority RCT to see whether a more focused RT can achieve a similar survival outcome. And, then, and, that, and what they found is that a two-year local region recurrence free survival and also a two-year survival uh, overall survival is again similar between the two groups. Although the p-value is statistically insignificant, but arguably the more focused R2 group seems to be have a seems to have a better uh, outcomes than the whole pelvis group. And in terms of toxicity, again we don't see any big difference between the two groups. I think the key of TMT is patient selection, as well as whether we're able to detect treatment failure early in the, in the treatment course. And therefore, if there's, if there's any treatment failure, we can consider that as a second right away. And the serum monitoring becomes very important. And uh, what do we monitor? They, they are, uh, basically includes urine cytology, cystoscopy with tumor site biopsy, examination of anesthesia, as well as imaging, uh, CD scan or PET scan. These would be very helpful. If you are really interested in the bladder part, then MRI scan might be helpful as well. Um, in terms of the surveillance frequency, it's quite frequent, and this has to be uh, explained to our patients as well. Usually it's done once every three months for first year, and then once every three to four months for second year, once every six months, three more years, and annually. And uh, because we wish to spare the bladder, but at the same time, we wish to make sure the patient is fine, I think it's kind of reasonable to have a stringent surveillance frequency and the patient really need to accept it. And if they can't comply to it, then again, we might need to think about something more radical.
And um, this is a graph showing how we actually monitor our patients. So continuous course, meaning that we give RT, chemo RT to the full dose until we have completed everything and we um, start to monitor the patients. But what I want to highlight is about the split course type of uh, protocol. Basically, uh, we can give induction RT to about 40 grade to get a concomitant chemo, chemotherapy. But um, uh, after the induction RT, we already start to survey the patients. We already try to assess whether there's a good treatment response. And I really think if there is a poor response to begin with, then we should already consider doing cystectomy because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we do not wish to compromise the cancer outcome. And then if the patient has a good treatment response and we continue with the consolidation RT to full dose, continue with the chemotherapy and then follow up afterwards. Regarding the comparison between radical cystectomy versus uh, TMT, understandably, the evidence is kind of, is relatively low quality and it's limited. And this meta-analysis is already kind of the best evidence that we have. 12 studies were included, retrospective in nature in all of them. Some studies were prepended score match. And the majority of studies included clinical T2 to T4 disease without any nodal metastasis. And uh, what they found is that uh, in terms of the overall survival, um, basically radio cystectomy seems to be doing better uh, than TMT. But I think if you look into the details, again, we need to interpret uh, with caution because uh, actually most of our studies seems to be rather um, showing a similar effect. But this meta-analysis is heavily biased by one to two studies, which are very large uh, in terms of sample size. And these two studies basically makes all the effects um, um, leads to, lies towards the uh, radical cystectomy side. So although it kind of favors radical cystectomy, but again, you need to recognize the evidence kind of, uh, kind of low quality and limited. And this year, in ESCO GU, there's a, a study which has created a lot of noises in the urology field. It is a propensity score study by uh, Slaughter. Uh, basically included T2, T4A disease. Uh, all patients were eligible for TM10 cystectomy, and they only included patients with solitary tumor less than seven centimeter. Uh, either they have no or just have unilateral hydronephrosis and without any extensive CIS. And they performed a propensity score matching study three to one about 1,000 patients in total. And what they found is that the overall survival um, is actually better in the TMT group. Though I must say, you know, the full paper is yet to be published. And I honestly have some doubt on the methodology simply because they have subsequent presentations in the AUA and AAU meetings and the numbers do not seem to match. Um, but uh, this is some um, potentially good evidence that we can compare between TMT and and rather cystectomy, and we look forward to just look at the full paper and see um, whether um, the methodology is really considered high quality. But another thing that is very interesting, of course, about immunotherapy, there are multiple theories on how RT and immunotherapy can work synergistically. Namely, RT induces changes to tumor cell immunophenotype, it enhances the cross presentation of tumor antigens, and Potentially, it increases the tumor cell susceptibility to immune-mediated cell death. And this is a figure showing how they may actually work together. So basically, if we give RT, then it can potentially upregulate the MHC and the FAS on the tumor cells. And this actually may help the T-cell media cytotoxicity. So it's not only just about RT effect, but it can actually potentiate your macrophage T-cells against those cancer cells. So these are theories that why immunotherapy might actually work together with RT. Unfortunately, so far, we don't have any high quality clinical trials addressing the use of immunotherapy in the case of TMT. But certainly there are some other trials where we can try to extrapolate and see how immunotherapy works when compared to chemotherapy in a muscle invasive bladder cancer setting. And this is the pure O1 study. Basically, it included 50 patients. Notably, half of the patients had clinical T3 disease, rather bad disease. And three cycles of new adjuvant pembrolizumab were given, followed by radical cystectomy. And their primary outcome is pathological comfort response, which, which is a PT0 disease. And they further stratified with the PTL expression by a combined positive score. 
And what they found is that 35 out of the 50 patients, that is 70% of patients, actually has a high CPS score. And among these patients, the complete pathological response rate is 54.3%. It's actually very high, even compared to a new adjuvant chemotherapy setting. But one thing very interesting is that those patients with CPS less than 10%, the complete response rate is just 13.3%. So it points to the fact that we may actually select patients um, who to receive immunotherapy based on the PDL1 CPS score. So there's something very promising. Another study, this is a, again a phase two trial looking into 24 patients with stage three disease. Um, they gave a combination treatment, anti CTL4, uh, CTLA4 together with uh, nifilumab. And again, 46% of the patients has a pathological complete response, which is T not and not disease. And again, um, these studies are very promising because the rate of T-naught is so high, uh, but then we need more clinical trials to really see whether it works in a TMT setting. And then in conclusion, TMT aims to preserve bladder quality of life without compromising cancer outcome. And this is very important. And therefore, patient selection is the key. And based on the literature that we have, patients with solid tumor, T2 disease without CIS, with no hydrogen resources, these are the real cases that we can consider TMT. And serum monitoring is important. Consider early cystectomy in case of treatment failure. And the use of immunotherapy can be a very exciting bladder sparing approach, but again, remains to be explored by future clinical trials. You know, to end my talk, when I um, returned from the EAU meeting, I was in a, in a flight. One of the movies that I watch is The Batman. Instead of saying TMT can be a crime, I tend to think that TMT is like a Batman in the city of crime. And the reason is that most of the time, we just rely on cystectomy for patients with muscle invasive cystectomy, but there are situations where cystectomy is just not feasible, or there are situations where the patient just, doesn't, just don't want to have cystectomy. And this is a situation where we may actually call for help, ask for MTT, and see whether TMT can be a savior to us. So even as a robotic surgeon, I think CMT certainly has a role, and the key is how we kind of put it into our clinical practice. Thank you very much for attention. Great, uh, Jeremy. Are there any uh, questions for our speaker? Okay, if no questions, then I'd like to ask Jeremy myself. Uh, we, we in the private sector at uh, Singapore, we have a lot of patients uh, younger and younger patients from the region who are diagnosed with uh, muscle-invasive bladder cancer uh, because they presented with frank hematuria, and they come to Singapore seeking for alternatives to conventional radical cystectomy. Many of them have heard about the, the mythical uh, wonders of immunotherapy and wonder if they can, uh, they can choose this. Is this a viable uh, long-term alternative to radical cystectomy? Uh, do you have any thoughts on this uh, based on your experience in Hong Kong? Well, I must say in my clinical practice, in such situations, radical cystectomy is still considered a, the standard of care. But I think when you counsel the patient, you will have an idea you know, whether he is willing to accept radical cystectomy or whether he is really keen for a blood swelling approach. And these are situations where we may think about alternative treatment. So it is something that we can discuss with our patient, but we also need to highlight not only the benefits, but the potential risks as well. Because after all, high quality study comparing between TMT versus radiosystectomy is still lacking. So they really need to understand the potential drawback and they need to comply with the surveillance protocol before we even consider this treatment. So in brief, it's something that we'll discuss, but they have to be well informed uh, about the potential risks as well. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, much uh, appreciated. Uh, Jeremy, hi, thanks. I, I enjoyed listening to your uh, talk. I think there's a paradigm shift, though, if you imagine what cystectomy does for a patient who has a T0 bladder after chemotherapy or is T2, the survival rates of these patients is unparalleled. And if we look at the Nick James randomized data, where you present disease-free survival, 
actually that's local regional disease-free survival. If a patient had metastatic disease in that cohort, they weren't uh, included as an event. So if we look at the Nick James data, it's really not very good for T2 disease in terms of overall survival. It's somewhere around 50 to 60% for uh, two year survival, whereas cystectomy is 70 to 80%. So I, I would put a paradigm where the patients who have got very favorable disease do best by radical cystectomy. And I wonder what your comment would be uh, about that. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. I think your, your comments are very valid. And I think if you look into the numbers, there are still some concerns and I agree with you. Um, so that's why I say radical cystectomy is still considered the center of care, especially when you are you know, treating young patients when we are looking for a cure in long run. But uh, again, as I mentioned, some patients, they really doesn't, they really don't want a cystectomy. They really, or some frail patients, which you think cystectomy might be too much for them. These are the situations where we may think about TMT. So there's something we'll discuss, but the patient needs to be well informed about potential risk. I totally agree with you. So uh, this leads us to the last lecture in this uh, series. Uh, we have just heard from Professor John Kelly. So Professor John Kelly is a consultant uh, urologist, specializes in robotic surgery for bladder and prostate cancer. And he is the lead for the London Cancer Urology uh, Sur Surgery Center and the robotic program at uh, UCLH. Uh, Professor Kelly is the clinical lead for urology at uh, Westmoreland uh, Street Hospital and this department is one of the largest in Europe delivering cutting-edge surgery using the latest technology. So uh, without much further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Kelly to talk to us about muscle-invasive bladder cancer uh, and uh, the role of a radical cystectomy. Hello to everybody at Eurofair 2022, and it's a privilege and honour to address you in Singapore. My name is John Kelly, and I'm coming to you from central London at University College, and I'm going to be talking about robotic radical cystectomy. Much of the work that I'm going to cite has been generated by either Pram Ketrapal or Shen Tan from Singapore and Malaysia, and two of the upcoming stars of British urology. Open radical cystectomy has been the standard of care for quite some time, and in some areas remains that today. However, it's a morbid procedure. Readmissions to hospital as high as 30%, and 90-day mortality as high as 3%. On the other hand, robotic radical cystectomy has been around now for more than 10 years. It is, however, technically difficult. There's a long learning curve, and the type of diversion even makes it more complex. As such, Adoption has not been the same as, say, for example, robotic radical prostatectomy. In terms of the learning curve, we did some work across nine European high volume centers. And contrary to what was held as maybe a 20 or 30 case procedure, we now know that centers need to do over 100 cases to be proficient in intracorporeal radical cystectomy. I believe that while there are clear benefits for the robotic procedure, such as reduced blood loss, and this is undoubted, enhanced vision, reduced analgesia requirements and early mobilization, but there are other factors that make a good cystectomy program. These include enhanced recovery and the relation between volume and outcomes. We can see this relation when we look at other operations, colon, esophagus, liver, etc. No matter how we look at them, whether they're short-term perioperative outcomes or long-term cancer outcomes, there is a benefit for high-volume centers. We previously have looked at the relation between outcome and the introduction of robotic surgery, showing a, a benefit in terms of length of stays 
when we compared open to the intracorporeal series, but also a further benefit when we enacted and activated the enhanced recovery European pathway. So a successful robotic program requires bringing all these components together. We can see this well when we look at what we call London cancer. In London, there was quite a lot of disparity of care. We knew that patients weren't being served well. We knew that outcomes weren't being measured. And we looked at what might be uh, the London Cancer Project, where we centralized complex surgery into fewer and fewer hospitals. This is best exemplified by the London underground map. If we move from West Kensington and go east towards the more deprived parts of London, towards Whitechapel and Stepney Green, the cancer life expectancy for patients drops by one year for every tube stop. In other words, there was a 10 year difference in life expectancy between affluent and less affluent parts of London. So London Cancer was established to centralise and the complex pelvic oncology was centralised to University College London, shown here. And in 2009, we performed 35 radical prostatectomies and 15 cystectomies. And now today, we perform about 850 radical prostatectomies and 120 radical cystectomies. This volume has enabled us to consistently audit and show our outcomes. And in terms of robotic surgery, we have consistently showed better outcomes for patients undergoing the new techniques that we've developed, the enhanced recovery, equivalent oncological outcomes, lower complication rates, shorter length of stay, better tolerated and physiologically unfit patients. Indeed, we have developed our own techniques for continent diversion, and we've measured and audited these. When we look at our data across observational meta-analysis of systematic reviews, we see a benefit for robotic over open surgery. However, it's interesting that when we look at this relation and we include only randomized data, we don't see that relationship. Nonetheless, our perception is that the robotic technique is far superior than open surgery. And we agreed with the editorial in European Urology that in the hands of experienced surgeons, robotic surgery with intracorporeal urinary diversion has the potential to provide better perioperative outcomes. That was not held by our commissioning body, the NHS England, who said there is not enough evidence for us to support commissioning this procedure. So we took it upon ourselves to perform a randomized controlled trial across UK sites. This was the IROC trial, intracorporeal robotic versus open cystectomy. And it was uh, across multiple sites in the UK, randomizing between intracorporeal cystect robotic cystectomy and open cystectomy. The primary objective was to measure days alive and out of hospital. This is the concept of aggregating length of stay and readmission days as a measure of outcome for surgery. We measured up to 20 secondary outcomes, and these included recovery, quality of life, analgesia, mobility, etc. So IROC screened 1,000 patients and randomized 338 patients, approximately evenly across the two uh, arms, open and robotic surgery. And uh, very few patients did not receive their planned treatment. The participants were evenly matched. The average age was uh, late 60s. Um, and in terms of outcomes, the outcomes in terms of surgical margins and lymph node yields were equivalent across the two arms. So we can see that in the days alive and out of hospital, there are more days alive and out of hospital for patients who received intracorporeal robotic radical cystectomy compared to open radical cystectomy. And this adjusted difference was equivalent to 2.2 days. If we reduce length of stay by this amount, it means that things have lined up. 
which equate to a quality delivery of service. And this is quite significant and clinically impactful. We also found that readmission rates following robotic radical cystectomy were 21%, and this compared to the higher readmission for patients receiving open radical cystectomy. We measured the secondary outcomes here, ensuring quality of life. And in all these domains that we measured, we see a benefit for robotic over open radical cystectomy. We see that benefit most for patients in the early phase recovery. In other words, patients uh, at five weeks or 12 weeks, and the differences were merging at later time points, such as 26 weeks or beyond. So we believe that this data shows us that using the robotic program, we see an early recovery of baseline activity and it would be logical to conclude that this merges in time with those patients having open surgery. When we looked at complications, there were some striking differences. For example, wound complications were 5.6% in robotic versus 17 in open. Infections were 23% in robotic versus 33 in the open. And a measure that we didn't expect was a much lower venous thromboembolic risk in patients undergoing robotic radical cystectomy. So the VTE rate was 1.9% in patients having intracorporeal robotic cystectomy versus 8.3% in patients having open radical cystectomy. And we believe that this is significant. If a trial of large enough numbers was performed, we would see a clinical output from this lower VTE risk in patients receiving the robotic surgery. We know that the randomized phase three trial laser had published in North America showing equivalent oncological outcomes. And this is what we also found uh, in the IROC trial. So we see no difference in oncological outcomes between robotic or open surgery. But when we look at our two-year recurrence-free survival, I think that these results tell us not only is robotic surgery acceptable as a delivery of uh, radical treatment to remove the bladder, but it is undoubtedly the gold standard treatment for patients who have muscle invasive disease. In conclusion, Patients who undergo intracorporeal radical cystectomy spent a statistically significant more time out of hospital than those receiving open surgery. Patients undergoing intracorporeal surgery have a higher quality of life, less disability, more stanima than those receiving open surgery, and there was a striking lower thromboembolic event and wound complication rate in patients receiving robotic surgery. As expected, there was no difference in overall survival. The results of this trial were published in JAMA in May uh, this year, and the first author, Pramit Ketrapal, released the results at the AUA. I'm so pleased to be able to release, release the results today uh, in Asia, and the abstract and the QR code directing to the JAMA article is highlighted here. So if we think about what are the components of a successful cystectomy program, I do believe that they combine robotic surgery and intracorporeal surgery with enhanced recovery, and that it is necessary, almost imperative, to do this in a high volume setting. In London, we did this by reorganizing our cancer services, and we showed the benefit of that. In conclusion, um, IRAC, intracorporeal radical cystectomy, I do now believe is the standard of care and the surgical approach of choice for patients undergoing radical cystectomy. And I also believe that it is the gold standard treatment for patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Kelly.
Um, any uh, questions from the ground? Oh, yes, uh, Jared. Hi, Professor Kelly. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Can I ask you, um, uh, given your uh, decade-long experience climbing the uh, rather steep learning curve for robotics hysterectomy, uh, did you move first from doing extracorporeal uh, urinary reconstruction to intracorporeal? Or did you jump right in at the start with intracorporeal? And uh, what, um, what uh, common complications or difficulties did you face at the very start? I noticed you've uh, uh, refined your technique of the neobladder as you went along. Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Jeremy. I think we started intracorporeal because, like you, we had developed expertise in robotic uh, radical prostatectomy first. And very often people say, when should you embark on a robotic cystectomy program? And I do believe that you have to have expertise on the platform. Uh, and certainly for us, uh, we would recommend that you have a good experience in prostatectomy first. And with that, we then moved straight to intracorporeal. And I think that was very much a European thing. A lot of European centers performed intracorporeal over uh, the uh, extracorporeal. <clears throat> and we also published evidence to show that many of the complications uh, for robotic cystectomy are actually technical failures. So things like you know, a, a leak of an anastomosis or drains falling out or stents falling back in. And it's a long, tiring operation, not from a physical point of view, but from a just the step-by-step -step procedures. And so there's more uh, potential for complications and technical complications in the early part of the learning curve. So I would recommend that if you're expert on the platform, uh, and usually that's with robotic prostatectomy, then that's the time uh, to switch to cystectomy and to do it intracorporeal. All our fellows now perform it intracorporeal. Can I? Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Can I ask you, so in, in your center, is it uh, mandatory for all patients to go for new adjuvant chemotherapy before you perform their robotic cystectomies? And does that make it easier or harder for you uh, uh, when you're doing the surgery? Yeah, so, so, it, so uh, neoadjuvant chemo is pretty much a standard uh, across the UK. And so if patients are eligible, they will be offered and they usually take it. It allows for us to schedule, etc. cetera. Um, and patients who have a low GFR of less than 65 or very elderly patients of poor performance status obviously wouldn't get neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, so I would say about 70% of our patients do. It doesn't make a huge difference to the surgery, is my opinion. Some patients will drop off in performance status during the chemotherapy, but again, with the modern intensivist type of approach to managing these cases, we will see a morbidity or mortality that's different between patients who get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and, and patients that don't. What we do see is that if we have a T0 after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then those patients do incredibly well in terms of overall survival after radical cystectomy. You can almost do a, do a discharge at six months in a patient who has had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, a T0 bladder, and a cystectomy. Now, we don't because there's about a 5% uh, failure in these cases. So we see neoadjuvant chemotherapy as an integral part of the radical cystectomy pathway. And a bit like how you presented, Jeremy, we're seeing then other modalities, uh, whether it's adjuvant immunotherapy, or if we have a very high-risk case, so we have a patient who has got positive uh, nodes and they're very young, very selectively, we might add radiotherapy uh, to our armamentarium after radical cystectomy. That's very selective though. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, if not, I have one question for uh, Dr. Kelly. Okay, like you mentioned, um, Robotic surgeons uh, usually started out with prostatectomy uh, as a prelude to uh, cystectomy because the prostatectomy, if you go 
via the posterior approach, uh, it, uh, as well as the lateral before dropping the bladder, all the way to opening up the endoparic fascia, it serves as training for uh, radical cystectomy part. Uh, uh, and uh, pelvic lymph node dissection uh, can be practiced with uh, the prostatectomy. But the, what about the intracorporeal um, the new bladder or ileal conduit? I find that the, this part, there is no equivalent training grounds for uh, urologists to practice before they uh, go on it. Any advice? So you've, you've hit it, you've, you're bang on the money. You know, with prostatectomy, you learn the nuances of, of exposing the bladder from below. And even if you don't do the posterior approach, that becomes almost a very routine step. So I, I've rarely seen a prostatectomist not be comfortable removing the bladder in one hour or one hour, 30 minutes. It's just a given that that's a direct uh, transition and it's bloodless. Um, the lymph nodes, <clears throat> yes, again, I accept you can do those in radical prostatectomy, but once you have those skills, doing a lymph node dissection is just a time thing. And then, yeah, I agree, you've got the urinary diversion, but it's by, it's a very intricate part of the procedure because you want to get it spot on, you need to get the anastomosis right. But once you set it up, there's nothing that difficult about doing it, it's almost the shortest part of the learning curve because it has step by step by step to do it. And when you do it in a, in a stepwise fashion and you have magnification and you have your uh, pneumoperitoneum, it's much, much easier than doing an extracorporeal approach. So we almost start our fellows. We, we have six fellows per year at UCLH, two from Australasia, uh, two from uh, Europe and two from the UK. And when they're doing cystectomy with me, they'll almost start with the urinary diversion because it's fine needlework. Um, and it's, as I say, stepwise, and it's easy to learn. Um, so I think I would recommend that if you're proficient with radical prostatectomy, uh, then you should go almost directly to intracorporeal uh, surgery. It, it just makes common sense. And that's what we showed in the IROC trial. By the way, in my presentation, I mentioned Pramit was first author. Pramit Ketrapal was joint first author uh, with Jim Cattle. But that's what we showed, that the difference for patients, I think, is doing the whole procedure intracorporeal as opposed to converting to open surgery at the end of the uh, accentuation. Uh, thank you. Okay, with that, uh, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Kelly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you.